Okay, hello, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to this press conference by the European Disability Forum, Inclusion Europe, and the European Association of Service Providers for Persons with Disabilities. I am Rachel Vaughan. I am Head of Operations at ESBD, and I'll be moderating this press conference. I'm a 27-year-old white woman with brown curly hair that goes past my shoulders. I'm wearing rectangular glasses and a black dress. I'm going to start with some logistical information. We have interpretation in English and Ukrainian. You can access that via the toolbar on the bottom of the Zoom panel by clicking the, either the English or the Ukrainian channel. We will be having speakers who will speak in Ukrainian, so please make sure that um, you can access the interpretation. We also have captioning. You can also enable that by clicking the three dots on the toolbar and um, clicking captioning or transcript subtitles. Um, and finally, we also have sign language, inter international sign language. You should be already pinned to your video. Um, if you have any problem with accessing any of these, please write a message in the chat um, and our technical support will help you the best they can. If you have a question, please can you write that in the Q&A box that you can also in um, talk in due course. Please, if you're a journalist, identify yourself so that we can um, identify you more easily. We don't have much time, so I'm gonna jump right in. I see there's already a lot of us who have joined us, so thank you very much for, for being here. It's been 15 days since the Russian military forces have invaded Ukraine. And since then, EDF, Inclusion Europe, ESPD, and many other organizations are increasingly concerned for the welfare and safety of hundreds of thousands of persons with disabilities who are living in Ukraine. As recently as yesterday, um, we saw new reports emerging from sources such as Oxfam that say that many large aid organizations report not having the capacity or ability to evacuate persons with disabilities. And the burden of seeking safety often falls onto the people themselves, all the while having to negotiate inaccessible transport, a lack of food, water, medicine, and living in a war zone. We're also um, receiving reports of persons with disabilities being left behind in institutions as people flee from the conflict. To tell us more about the situation, we have two people from Ukraine who are representing disabled persons organizations with networks across Ukraine. And so I'll hand over to them in a minute. Thank you very much for both taking the time to be here and to speak with us today. We greatly appreciate it. We'll have around 20 minutes of interventions um, by our speakers, followed by the chance for questions. As I said, please put any questions that you have in the Q&A box so that we can easily identify it. We understand that we have a lot of you here today from um, the disability movement, understandably, but we please ask, can you make space for the journalists who have joined us um, so they can ask the questions that they need as we want to be able to raise awareness for the situation of persons with disabilities as much as possible. So with that, I will move to our first speaker, Valerie Shushkovich, President of the National Assembly of Persons with Disabilities in Ukraine. Valerie, we last spoke to you on the 28th of February, and you told us about your Paralympic team who were still making their way to China and intending to compete. And I'd first like to say congratulations to the team for their amazing performance so far, especially in the current circumstances. And I'd like to ask you now to um, tell us a little bit more about the current situation for persons with disabilities in Ukraine. Thank you. I would like to welcome to all those who are taking part in this very important meeting. First and foremost, I would like to say that I'm head of the National Assembly of uh, Persons with Disabilities, but I'm also the president of the National Olympic Paralympic Committee of Ukraine. So right now, I am physically in Beijing in China uh, at the Paralympic Games. 
And this is a cynical situation because here we have thousands of people with disabilities. So those are sportsmen and sportswomen, and um, they have uh, the right to exercise their physical activities, their sports activities, and the Paralympic uh, Games are taking place at the time when the war started. They picked up that specific point of time on purpose to start the war. Now, let uh, me uh, talk uh, about our activities. First and foremost, I would like to thank uh, all um, NGOs. I would like to thank uh, all international organizations and European organizations who are actively supporting us. You give us uh, active financial and humanitarian aid. Our refugees are being, to, I know that many organizations are talking to their governments so as to provide persons with disabilities with relevant protection. I would like to say that uh, the Ukrainian government does whatever they can or cannot even do so as uh, uh, to address social problems that are linked, that are related to the Russian aggression against Ukraine. It is important to provide for the security of our citizens to protect their lives. And uh, today we're facing a critical situation. So the principal question is how to save those people. I would like to say that um, over this period of time of the war, it is the war, it's nothing else but the war. Uh, uh, Russians have launched 710 missiles on the territory of Ukraine. They're using cluster bombs and uh, other banned weaponry. And um, the calamity is that I'm here in the wheelchair in front of you. And uh, for instance, uh, the blind persons or persons who are using prosthetics or people who have uh, mental disabilities, those people are completely helpless and defenseless. There is no way to defend them against missiles and rockets. So it is very important to, to work with the National Assembly of Persons with Disabilities, and we are coordinating the work of the uh, government and they coordinate with NGOs. And so they provide um, the persons with disabilities with food, uh, medical, um, uh, medical drugs, and information on evacuation, which is very important. And even, even, um, even finding the way uh, to a bomb shelter is already a critical situation for any person with any disability. Just to remind you that there are cases when people die in bomb shelters because they're blocked there and there is, there is no water, there is no access to water in bomb shelters and people die. So right now in Ukraine, uh, the Russians uh, have already uh, destroyed 202 schools, 304 hospitals, and 1,500 residential buildings. I am in Beijing. I'm in China. B people call me, and a person calls me and says, listen, I'm on the 16th floor in a high-rise residential building. They started bombing again, and we have never had bombing before. No one has ever thought that uh, our uh, city would be sh shelled with uh, rockets, missiles, and bombs. I am all alone. Valeri, help me. Get me out of here. Save my life. And this is what she says. And it is so difficult to help those people. I see that. And today, we understand that we need your help. Uh, uh, but I also would like to say one more thing that is so very much important. The entire civilized world is in solidarity with uh, Ukraine. Everyone supports us. Thank you. And uh, for that, and also, if this civilized world, if it is indeed civilized, uh, it should not only be passively uh, with us in the spirit of solidarity with us. They cannot remain passive about uh, the massive murder of people. And this is what is happening. We have mass murder of people. And uh, the most vulnerable are persons with disabilities on the wheelchairs, uh, uh, with visual impairment, hearing impairment, and so on and so forth. Those are helpless people. They're easier to kill. I address all of your plea to you. Please address your governments to do to stop murder from the sky. Why are Ukrainian killed being killed from the sky? The president of Ukraine, the prime minister of Ukraine are addressing everyone, the entire international community, all the governments. Yes, you may be concerned. You may 
feel sorry and i'm thanking you for that thank you for your solidarity but please try please try to address your governments influence your governments influence the international organizations in, influence the military organizations please stop the killing from the sky of ukrainian citizens and first and foremost those who die are helpless people and the most vulnerable people, the most helpless are people with disabilities. Please stop the murder from the sky. I do count on your influence, uh, your wonderful organizations, your very effective organizations who unite the persons with disabilities and you're so very well organized. And I think that such organizations should be capable of influencing the governments and the international community if it is civilized indeed. The point is not only to give aid, it's the point is not only to be onlookers. It is important to stop the aggressor, to stop the murderer who is killing us. We are counting on you. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll now move on to Radio Kravchenko, who is from the VGO Co Coalition in Ukraine, representing uh, persons of intellectual disability in Ukraine. So I hand over to you now, Razia. Are you there? Yulia, I don't know if you can speak in that place. Yes, hello. Hello, hello. Good afternoon. Please confirm that you hear me. Yeah, we can. Thank you very much. Yes, I am so very much grateful for the organization of this press conference. And I'm very grateful for the kind of support that is given by all European partners that we know. We have um, seen two weeks of horror. And uh, personally, right now, I am in the city of Kiev, in the capital, together with my adult, adult daughter. She is autistic, and she has behavioral and uh, mental disorders, and it is very difficult for us here. And currently, the situation is such that we cannot possibly leave the city of Kiev. We cannot leave our flat. Because I also have my mother. My mother is 82 years old, and um, she's not. she cannot move. We live on the seventh floor in the residential building, and we cannot go downstairs to the bomb shelter. Even that we cannot do. Please believe me, we're not alone in this situation. We're not the only ones in this type of a situation. There are many of us in this situation all, all over Ukraine. And especially this is uh, the case of those uh, who are providers of cares, who are caregivers to their elderly parents. Um, uh, this um, uh, elderly people have uh, many other concomitant diseases and they cannot be moved. I fully agree with Valery Shushkevich. We do ask the world to close the sky over Ukraine. It is so difficult for me to speak right now. I would like to invite Raisa Kravchenko. Raisa Kravchenko is a member of our organization, and she would be capable of giving you more detailed information. But once again, thank you very much for your kind support. Raisa. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak up for Ukraine, for Ukrainian people with intellectual disabilities. But first of all, thank you for the mighty support which we feel every day, uh, both our organization, families of people with intellectual disabilities, and And we know that there are some points to which you can address and you will receive aid. And we know that uh, my, a major part of that aid came from Europe and uh, uh, arrived internationally. Uh, we are the network of 118 
local non-governmental organizations, which unite uh, above 14,000 families uh, with a member with intellectual disabilities. And of course, we would like to speak about this particular uh, group of Ukrainians. Uh, because people with intellectual disabilities very often have behavioral problems. Uh, they can't comprehend what is going on. And uh, this total mess, this aggression, uh, this concerns of the parents uh, give rise to behavioral uh, difficulties. And uh, you have, as a mother, I have a 37-year-old son with behavioral problems, and I have to dedicate all my son, uh, all my time to my son, uh, because uh, he's aggressive and he's auto aggressive, and I have uh, to harmonize his feelings and his behavior. Yesterday we had an internal national meeting of our network and uh, uh, we would ask um, we would like to tell you about our major needs and uh, we would appeal for your help the major need of families uh, who take care of a person with intellectual disabilities is personal care for uh, the beloved one um, you, 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 you understand that all the daycare uh, programs stopped. So if my son, if Yulia's daughter, I used to go to the center, to the daycare center. Now they stay all days at home uh, and they are concerned and they are agitated. And of course we need personal help, personal assistance, to our children. One of our NGO leaders says that because of her son autism, she uh, can only leave him at home for one hour, which means that she can be queuing uh, in the pharmacy. She can't be queuing uh, in the uh, food store. She can't be queuing in the bank machine to get some currency. So she has no supplies. If she had some personal assistant to her son, she could be able uh, to go out and she could be able to just pur purchase uh, some food at least. That's a major thing uh, for all of us to have personal, uh, personal assistance to our uh, beloved ones with intellectual uh, and behavioral disabilities. Then another major problem for people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities uh, is a lack of medication. I mean, medication uh, which are prescribed by psychiatrists. Uh, the medication can only be purchased with prescriptions. Um, mainly it is anti-epileptic uh, and psycho, uh, psycho, uh, psycho, uh, psychological drugs prescribed by a psychiatrist. Uh, so far, uh, the government does not uh, give an effective way uh, to solve the problem. We are told uh, that uh, you can address your family doctor, but you have to come to your family doctor, uh, which is uh, one week to wait at least. So it is a shortage of uh, medication prescribed by psychiatrist. And uh, there is a problem, uh, uh, people lost their jobs. The family, those in the family uh, who uh, are employed and who have their job, they lost their job and they lost uh, uh, their earnings. And uh, so we are grateful to Inclusion Europe 
network. We are uh, grateful to uh, the European Home NGO from Denmark, uh, Henrik Hobro, who already provided uh, financial support. And uh, according to Ukrainian legislation, uh, we are paying to separate families uh, your European donation. And we have a limited uh, the amount of donation without tax. And we are doing that with the help of Inclusion Europe, we hope uh, to give money to uh, more than 250 families. Thank you for that. And we would also tell you about the post-war time. Uh, all, our, uh, all our more than 100 NGOs stopped uh, their professional activities and could only volunteer. Uh, many people uh, go to Europe or elsewhere, and we uh, would uh, apply for your support to restore uh, the daycare services of our NGOs. We would need uh, a kind of uh, re remunerate. Uh, we would need the kind of uh, recreation. Re uh, uh, we would need uh, to start to kick off our activities anew because all uh, daycare services are stopped. That's one thing. Another thing, which is not uh, unfortunately sold by our authorities in the COVID times, that when a mother or another caregiver dies or is ill and cannot provide care, then the person with intellectual disabilities remained careless. So we would be grateful for your help uh, to uh, start uh, supported living, uh, which is absent in Ukraine at all for people with intellectual disabilities. And we would definitely need rehabilitation. Uh, we see that mothers are burning out. We see that our children adult children uh, have mm, exhausted with all this mess and they would definitely need uh, rehabilitation. Uh, and I would like to finish with uh, the expression of our hope that Ukraine will win. Uh, and we do realize that it is not only the battle for Ukraine, it is the battle uh, for civilization. It is the battle against contemporary fascism. And we hope uh, that all the international community will support us, that Ukrainian sky will be closed and that uh, Putin uh, will feel uh, strong, strong opposition. And finally, uh, civilized Ukraine will win and uh, we will go back to peaceful and safe uh, live. Thank you for your help. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to both of you for so clearly yeah. um, describing your current situation and your current needs and also your future needs. I will now move on. Please feel free to put any questions that you have in the Q&A box. And I will now move on to Yanis Varakastanis, the chair of the International Disability Alliance. Yes, if you have a few words to say. Thank you. The International Disability Alliance and the European Disability Forum have called already on the Russian Federation to stop immediately the war action in Ukraine and also have called on humanitarian actors to ensure that also persons with disabilities are protected they are in safety in this incredible situation. And all to respect for most the Russian Federation, their obligations under international human rights and humanitarian law, especially the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, in particular Article 11, which is about 
the protection of persons with disabilities in situation of risk and conflict. There are 2.7 million persons with disabilities registered in Ukraine. Since the beginning of the war, persons with disabilities face compounded threats, as we have heard already, increasing their risk of abandonment, violence, injury, and death. There is a lack of access to evacuation support, a lack of access to information, and a lack of access to emergency shelter. Women and girls with disabilities are disproportionately facing risk of sexual and gender-based violence, in particular women with intellectual disabilities and psychosocial disabilities. UNICEF estimate at least 82,000 children are segregated from society, thousands of adults with disabilities also reside in institutions. We are already aware of such institutions that have run out of basic essentials such as food, water, essential medication, and fuel for heating. We are told that in some cases, staff have left, leaving the residents without support. This is an impending humanitarian crisis within the crisis. The humanitarian response, including evacuation, emergency aid, must make specific efforts to identify these people who are facing this situation and they are forgotten. At the same time, Persons with disabilities who have managed to evacuate by themselves are not being supported when they arrive in neighboring countries. Reception centers are overwhelmed and have no access provisions meaning those with least possibility to access are the most to be forgotten. We call for national governments and humanitarian response mechanisms to ensure that refugees with disabilities have full access to all services, including integration, education, livelihood, and social protection. Finally, we are aware that many of the examples of disability inclusion in this response so far have come from organizations of persons with disabilities themselves, not from the national governments or humanitarian community. While this is commendable, and another example of the resilience and knowledge that the disability community has within itself, it should not be the case. We want to be part of the solution, but not the solution ourselves. This is a crisis within a crisis. We need a full mobilization of all possible human, financial, and other resources to support the most neglected 
the most forgotten Ukrainians in this unacceptable war that is taking place. The Russians should stop the war now. Thank you very much, Janice. I think you, you picked on a lot of important points there that we all agree with. I'll now move to a few questions before we move to our next round of speakers. So we are aware from the European Disability Forum that there are estimates of around 2.7 million persons with disabilities in Ukraine. And including Europe estimates that 261,000 persons with intellectual disabilities are living in Ukraine. Um, but I think maybe what is missing is any data on how many persons with disabilities have been able to leave Ukraine. So I don't know, Valerie or Razia, if you have any information or data of you know of persons with disabilities who have been able to leave Ukraine. And either one of you feel free to answer. Yep, feel free, Matthew. You know, <clears throat> we don't have exact uh, figure, but we don't know that those with severe disabilities and those uh, whose parents are old and uh, weak, they do not uh, leave Ukraine. They stay uh, with their families. We only know that we know that uh, many people with disabilities are not able to leave Ukraine. We know, for example, that uh, one organization left Kharkiv, which is being bombed, but still they moved uh, to Dnipropetrovsk, to Dnipro and Dnipropetrovsk region. Uh, which is also under risk. And uh, I will tell you the case uh, in the suburbs of Kiev, when a cerebral palsy uh, guy uh, over 20, uh, who suffered from bombing and he was wounded. And as there was no medical care, he died within two days. He was dying for two days and he was buried in his yard in his garden. And so uh, mainly uh, the mothers with children with disabilities who are still young and who are strong enough, uh, they left, uh, many of them left for Poland, many of them left for uh, Germany and other European countries. Uh, but those uh, who have uh, uh, most severe forms of disabilities, they are not able to leave because uh, the way the trip is so difficult uh, and so long that people can't stand and they just don't move from their places. Thank you. Thank you. Could you maybe, if they were to, to leave, do you know what they would need to be able to do so? What, what needs to be put in place by aid organizations or um, others to be able to enable these families to leave? You know, uh, I had an, uh, I, I myself is uh, 100 kilometers from Kiev and it is a safe place. And once I had uh, three seats in a car uh, for people uh, from my organization with intellectual disabilities to leave, but all rejected this opportunity because uh, they said, uh, my son of 30 years old is used to my flat and he has autism. Uh, he will be agitated in a different place with different people. Or for example, we have a father of 92, totally blind. I, I'm, I am alone and I'm not able to cope with two. The same, for example, as our director with Yulia. Uh, she has a daughter, 25 years old, who is intellectual. Plus, she has a mother immobile, totally immobile. She, she is not able. I, I can't imagine. You will. Uh, it is only helicopter, which is impossible. Thank you, Valerie. Would you like to come in? Yeah. Yes, uh, I would like to give an answer to the number of uh, persons uh, with disabilities who have already left abroad. 
or at least have left the war zones. Uh, so bombing is done in Kharkiv, so Mitchell, uh, Kiev, and so on. So if we look at the overall statistics, two million citizens of Ukraine have already left. That's official statistics, but I fully agree with uh, Mrs. Kravchenko. I know how much time it takes now, these days, to move. Let's say I have a car and I have a person with a disability, with any type of disability. It takes a lot of time to travel from Kiev to Lviv, Western Ukraine, not abroad. Um, it takes five to six days to travel by car from Kiev to Lviv because there are so many checkpoints and there is a risk that the Russians may attack and, uh, the car and they shell the roads. Actually, um, there is um, a very alarming statistics on the number of passenger cars that have been fired at by the Russians. So, so when cars move, and those are civilian cars, they're not military vehicles, they're being shot at by the Russians and people die. We have a plethora of such cases. So in this situation, I may say that out of the two million of the Ukrainians who have already left within that, only a few are persons with disabilities who have been able to leave. Well, that is because so that many of them are not capable of leaving their homes and are not capable of finding transport. But even if they do have transport, it's very difficult to actually reach the destination for a person with disabilities. It's actually impossible. And the last point, yes, there are evacuation trains. There are. And by the way, uh, when people board the trains, the Ukrainian authorities do give priority to persons with disabilities. However, if there is a crowd, just imagine this situation. There is a mass of people on boarding the train, no tickets. All you need to do is run away and because they're shelling, they're bombing. So to board the train, and it's a regular train for a person with disability, if there is a crowd, of, uh, if there is a crowd of people, and if this is a, a, a blind person, or let's say that person is in a wheelchair, so practically in the crowd, boarding the train is practically not possible. So they stay at home. And actually not at home. They're being bombed at, they're being shelled by missiles. So uh, it's very difficult to say how many persons with disabilities have been able to leave. Now, speaking of evacuation and how international organizations may help with evacuation. And it's important to help the Ukrainian government so, so that uh, they can effectively help with per persons with disabilities during the war. Because uh, now, basically, we're facing a plethora of problems, medical problems, and so on and so forth. So, as far as the things that could be used, that could be done by the Ukrainian government, they should have specific funds. They should have earmarked funds for persons with disabilities. So if the Ukrainian government is receiving additional funding, it should be earmarked funding specifically for persons with disabilities. It would be very, very helpful if the money that is given is earmarked for persons with disabilities specifically. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe just to move to those who are in Ukraine, Ukraine and intend to stay in Ukraine. Um, Razia, if you talked about the need for personal assistance. Is that possible right now? Are there people there who can do that? Is it merely a financial constraint or is it also an issue of having people who are available with that, um, those skills to be able to provide that support? I don't know if Yulia or Razia, you can uh, comment on that. Gunther, would you, you like to come in? Uh, yes, we do have uh, people who are capable of helping, but the difficulty is that uh, if those are volunteers, then volunteers are not there on an ongoing basis. So today you have a volunteer, but tomorrow the volunteer would not come. So they are not really committed to give aid on a continuous basis. So yesterday, for instance, we uh, had a meeting within our organization and we were talking about finding people who would be paid for. 
and that they would become service providers on a paid basis. So there is such possibility to have service providers who will be paid for. However, uh, we have limited funding. We need to find funding for that. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gunther, would, would you like to come in now? Yes, thank you so much. I'll be very happy to come in. In now, just the course I got to really um, a lot of experience around people with disabilities and refugees at the moment. We are working um, on behind of the European Disability Forum together with Ukraine government. And uh, I'm absolutely sure that very many people with disabilities evacuated right now. Every day we have a group of so more than 500 people with disabilities. We are calling our, uh, us and saying that they are not able to evacuate and they need to provide us support. So from Ukrainian side, we have a people who are working together with the administration of the Ukraine. And as Mr. Suknevich said, it's a very long time to go to the war. So we are organizing about three or four places to stay for night for them to go to Lviv. And uh, at the moment in, in Lviv together with Latvian government and uh, Polish activities, we are organizing special refugee center for people with disabilities which could provide all kind of accessibility they do need in order to get a bit rest when they uh, have at the border. After that, uh, they can cross the border. And at the moment, European Disability Forum is organizing coordination system with all kinds of disability organizations in different countries, not only those which are involved around the border, like eh? Slovakia, Poland, and others, but also those who after that will be able to um, take the people with disabilities, accommodate them, and help them to get all kinds of services they do need. So we are working very active on it, and I, at the moment, representing European Disability Forum and also the Latvian organization, which is uh, very close in communication with some organizations in Ukraine. And I think that all kind of help and support is very needed. The help and support from the volunteers and those in the different countries who will be happy to accommodate people with disabilities by providing accessibility. We need also some coordination system to make it as uh, fast as possible because people can't stay for a long time. They need a place where to go. They need to know address where to go just to be sure that everything is okay with them. And we are a little bit disappointed that Europe a little bit slowly give reaction to a situation what's happened. We have a feeling that many people do need different social care system um, services in different countries. And we are not sure how many people will be able to get this care because uh, different countries has a, not enough money, not enough budget, especially in those countries which is on the border, like Poland, for example. But what I'd like to say, we are working very hard at the moment. We are involved a lot of people from different countries. We are very open. If anyone else will be happy to join us by any kind of help, especially from those countries, which is not more boarding countries, but who would like to accommodate people. Because just in a five minute, I get information that train with more than 200 people with disabilities is coming to Lviv. And we are sitting and thinking what we can do for them. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much. I just have a quick follow-up question. You mentioned that an important thing is to have countries who are willing to, to take persons with disabilities and allow them to seek refuge. 
we know from ESPD as a representative of social service organizations, we have individual organizations offering um, refuge in the Netherlands or Spain. But do you know from a national level which countries are coming forward and saying, yes, we will take persons with disabilities? Or again, is that information not available? Uh, we are working at the moment with those countries who can do that. At the moment, as I said already, we have a very good cooperation with Lithuania and Poland. We have some contacts in Italy already and uh, in some other countries in Germany. So, but what we are looking for, for a real contact of organizations who could go to Kiev or not to Kiev, but to Lviv or to border of Poland, not going into Ukraine because it's very dangerous. Pick up those people and help them to go to places which are safe to them. Because at the moment it's a really big problem with medication, like insulin, for example. It's a really big problem with the dialysis because people who have a kidney problem can't do that and it is part of their life, very important part of their life. They don't have so many, they need so many practical things at the moment. And after that, we can have a next step to think about political decisions, how we can avoid the situation that we have then now in the future, because we have to think how ready our countries, our European Union countries are for a situation. And I would say we are not ready. We have only point number 11 in our conventional rights of people with disabilities. But this point is just a point in a convention and we need to take next steps to make it much more practical to make our shelters accessible without stairs and to organize system of evacuation and helping people with disabilities. Thank you very much. Um, I'll move now quickly to our two final speakers. So we have Milan Severpa from the Director of Inclusion Europe. And I'll give you a few minutes to, to speak. Thank you. Uh, to summarize the key points uh, based on what Inclusion Europe learns working with organizations uh, such as the VGO coalition in Ukraine and others helping uh, refugees uh, also in Poland and elsewhere. There are 260,000 people with intellectual disabilities in Ukraine. Most of them and their families cannot leave their homes to protect themselves from war. There are 30,000 people with intellectual disabilities in general in residential care homes in the country. They are at grave risk of being left without food, without supplies, without water, or without care as staff leave the areas. There is urgent need to provide food, water, medicine, and other necessary items to the families and to people in the residential care homes. Around 10% of refugees are people with disabilities, both internally in Ukraine and uh, in the neighboring countries where they go. They need accessible accommodation, rehabilitation, equipment, and many other means of support. Disability organizations and other non-governmental organizations are doing tremendous work supporting people with disabilities and their families in Ukraine and in neighboring countries. They need proper coordinated support from national and EU institutions and from humanitarian organizations. And first and foremost, Russia must stop its war on Ukrainian civilians. Thank you. Thank you very much, Milan. I now hand over to Maya Donova, Secretary General of the European Association of Service Providers for Persons with Disabilities. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I would like to start by thanking Raisa, Gunta, Julia, and Valeri for being us because they are 
testimonials of what is happening are the basis of uh, what we need in order to make your voices heard and our position more clear on what it needs to be done. And I think that for the past two weeks, if we started from a bit of a chaos, confusion, a lack of coordination, a lack of synchronization, now it's very clear what it needs to be done, both on the ground and on the border when it comes to supporting uh, persons with disabilities and the organizations who work with that with them so i would like to say that for us uh in a way it's very clear what to do but it also in a way it's very um it's it's not easy to to listen what you have to say uh and we're both thankful but on the other hand we see that right now people and communities are the one who are taking the responsibility for everything instead of the systems and people gather in communities to be stronger and communities gather in system in order to regulate how how they function and right now we see that the systems are not responding the way that they should and it's all left to the people and the communities uh, most of you mentioned the support of volunteers and the support of individual caregivers which is crucial but it shouldn't rely only on that the systems that we have the european values that we stand for should be more responsible to what right now is needed to happen in ukraine uh, i have to say also that we are urging the eu to support the ngos that are still working in ukraine and i cannot even imagine how difficult it is to still sustain any type of activity if bombs are flying around i would also like to say that we are delighted to see that the we care initiative by the commission is starting to to be a reality but in a way we have to stop being concerned and we have to go towards more actions towards a decision and towards a budget that is actually targeting the organization and the support that is needed now today yesterday because i i cannot ignore valeria what you said in the beginning we have to save the people and this is not something that can be postponed and i understand that with each day and each upcoming webinar and each upcoming meeting we are becoming very clear what needs to be done and it just needs to be done so i i on behalf of espd on behalf of our members we really urge the networks the commission and the authorities to stand the ground of european values to stand the ground of human rights and to do what needs to be done to support the local ukrainian organizations to support the border organization and social service providers who support the upcoming refugees with disabilities, but also to remember that most of the people with disabilities are still in Ukraine. Most of the organizations who are there need the support now, and that needs to stop. And I hope that the next time we meet, we can already discuss how the funds are being used and how they're, they're reaching the families that need them and how the organizations are not working only with volunteers but with caregivers who can be there on daily basis and i hope i will not hear any more stories as the one that was shared regarding the young man with cerebral palsy who who had his grave in the garden because that is just devastating and that should not be a story told in a european country in 2022 it should not be told in any country so thank you very much for being with us today. And I, I hope that this is just the next step in what we need to do. Be strong, we are with you and you're being heard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya. We are coming into the last 10 minutes of our session. Um, we can go on a little longer if needed, but we will lose our interpreters who I would like to thank and both the sign language captioners and doing the Ukrainian to English. Um, thank you very much for being here and doing this, but I'd like now to spend the last few minutes to give the floor again to our Ukrainian colleagues and to um, allow you to have some final statements that, that you would like to say, that you would like to communicate um, to, to any press or journalists um, that you'd like them to hear. So Valerie, if I give the floor to you first. Is the interpretation working now? Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. I would like to say that one of the generals of American Army just said that now it's more difficult for me to look at how peaceful civilians are dying. It's painful for me to see, more painful to see how people are dying of the bombs in Ukraine, then they are, then others are afraid of the escalation of uh, the conflict of the war in Ukraine. Also in Mariupol, super bomb has been just dropped on the uh, maternity ward in Mariupol. The uh, hole in the ground made by this bomb is so deep that a soldier went down to the bottom and couldn't get out. This is way bigger than anything else. These are the bombs that are falling down on civilian infrastructure. I'd like to turn to the uh, the organizations of the international and European level and all journalists listen to me now, do stop this uh, death from this falling from the sky. Uh, number two, indeed, in Ukraine today, there are NGOs for and with people uh, with disabilities that are coordinating and doing their work in these difficult conditions they're cooperating with the government and international organizations and they as as they said they need financial support they need money which could be working with the, could be distributed to this kind of help working with the government organization because it is only only an ngo in specific organization, in specific place, working together with government, can only uh, this, these are the organizations that can, only, that can help the disabilities. So I'm appealing to the organizations and governments who are able able to provide this financial help and uh, implement this. I wish you thank you very much for your attention. I wish you a lot of health and peaceful skies above your heads. Thank you very much, Valerie. Um, Yulia or Razia, if you would like to come in. I would just use one minute of your time. I would like to ask very much, please do not just observe, watch us. Because we are feeling that we are part of some gladiators game, gladiators fights, and people are just watching it. But please. Europe will only have it worse if you're going to be silent, if you're not going to call your governments, upon your governments to, for, for help for Ukraine, to actions, to no-fly zones, if you don't call for that. In two, in two weeks, in one month, you will be tired. You'll be overwhelmed by our refugees, by our people with disability. You'll be saying, my God, how we're, we're tired of you so much. Please go back home. We don't care about your war any longer please this we are begging you please stop this killer and provide a no-fly zone stop this thank you thank you very much um Razi, if you want to have the final word do you want Razia, do you want to say anything else Okay. Um, thank you to um, or Yanis. Are you available to say some final words? Yes. May, may I? Yeah. In my opinion, and it is what we have done, all of us who are here today, this uh, press conference, but also others uh, and our members, we should uh, really call again on the European Union to direct, to direct, I mean, specific funding for humanitarian support to persons with disabilities and their families. Specific funding, I mean. And secondly, we should um, ask the, the European Union and our governments to, to try to get, even if Russia uh, votes against, a, a resolution at the level of the Security Council or the General Assembly of the United Nations 
for refugees with disabilities for, from Ukraine, for persons with disabilities from Ukraine. And, and I'm sure that uh, we're going to continue mobilizing all the actors in the field internationally to, to provide the necessary support and to respect, as I said at the beginning of my initial remarks, their obligations under the international humanitarian human rights law and the CIPD. So our colleagues in Ukraine should feel that they are not alone. We are with them. We do our utmost. We are going to continue. But first and foremost, as Milan said, Russia, Russia should stop the war immediately. This is the first and foremost that should happen. They should stop the war. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll end there and a final thank you to our speakers um, for providing us um, with your experiences and speaking so well in such difficult situations. Um, we are with you. Uh, we are with you in action and um, we hope that this war um, comes to an end soon and we will be there to support you both during it and after it. So thank you everybody for joining us. Um, a press release will be sent out after this and also the recording of the webinar will be available. Yes,